Somebody has to start this. Uh, it's not me. Yes. I have a question about astrology. Mm -hmm. I had a session with Brent, and he told me some things that Saturn was bad, and, uh, and he told me also not to take notes that he was going to take it. Mm -hmm. But it didn't sound like good news. Fortunately, I can't remember much of it. <laughs> and he did something happened, and he wasn't able to get the tape after all. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of grateful, and I've never really gone back for astrology because I thought if the planets are against me, that's not a good thing. <laughs> Okay, so actually we have a session with uh, Swami Vamadeva, who's one of the world's best astrologers, and we'll save this for then. Other than uh, astrology is a mathematical system, Vedic mathematics, and it gives you the statistical probability of events, correct me if I'm wrong, okay, uh, based on karma. and. You know, the past creates the conditions of the present, but whatever happens in the present, you still have a choice how to deal with those conditions. So Vedic astrology is not for everyone. But those who understand it, it's actually an affirmation of freedom rather than determinism for those who are self-aware. But tomorrow you can say more when we get to Okay, and then the expert is here. So can, can we ask people to use the microphone? Yeah, let's use the microphone. Yeah. It's amazing. So, yeah. Answer this, I don't know. The uh, uh, second answer is it really doesn't matter. You know, uh, we are one species on one planet in a universe of multi dimensional, infinite domain. So we can only participate through our own evolution. When I say one billion people, I throw out a number, and you know, because hundred million now seems so easy. <laughs> and we're almost there. So uh, I think, though, if consciousness is a field that transcends space-time, where um, there is no distance between us and the infinite, the, the more of us who are aligned with that, the higher the likelihood is of a shift in collective consciousness. Um, but we cannot fathom the infinite mind. You know, black mind might be saying the human species was an interesting experiment that didn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There have been experiments in the past, dinosaurs, others. So I think what our allegiance to ourselves should be to try and understand that domain of awareness and be one with it, which is not personal. I know that's a huge leap, but everything we experience is right now in that awareness. So you've actually given me a 
you can sit down. She's giving me an excuse to talk about something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, then we can come back, okay? So what's the most common word we use in any language? I. I. Right? What's the most common word? It's always I. I went to a movie. I am in love. I like this food. I don't like the weather. We hardly say anything without using the word I. And also in our meditation, we also begin with the question, who am I? Right? So I think let's take a minute to examine who am I or what am I and where am I? Okay, because without I, there is no experience. Without I, there is no experience. So when I ask somebody, where are you? What's the usual response? I'm here, right? So if I had my back towards you and I said, where are you, Roger? He's likely, he's not likely to, but other people are likely to. I'm here. That's our experience of I, somewhere here, right? And what's our experience of the other? Somewhere there. So if I ask, uh, where are you, Leah? Where are you? Here. And where am I? Here. <laughs> <laughs> She's smart. Most people say, you are there. She has the right answer though. So, let me ask that in a different way. Right this moment, where is the experience of seeing me happening for you, or what you refer to as I. Where is that experience yeah. of seeing me happening? Right. Okay, so a lot of people do that, especially scientists, and I do this experiment with scientists, cognitive scientists, neuroscientists. They, some of them, depending on their orientation, they say, I'm seeing you here in my eyes. And the reason that's not true is your eyes are about 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. By the time light or photons get into your eyes, they get inverted because they go through a lens. Your retina is curved and the eyes are 9 centimeters apart. So if the experience of seeing me was happening in your eyes, then you should be seeing two of me upside down, <laughs> about this big, and nine centimeters of white. What's happening to your eye, in your eyes? There are, you know, in the retina there are electrochemical reactions, period. You're not experiencing seeing me in your eyes. So then some people do what you did just now. They say it's happening here, the experience. Referring to the brain, your brain is 14 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 7 centimeters. So how do I fit inside your brain? How does this room fit inside your brain? You, know, you go outside, you see the Milky Way galaxy. How does that whole thing fit inside your brain? So the experience of seeing anything, not just me, but a galaxy or this room which experiences in four dimensions you know, length, breadth, width and time. That experience is not happening in your brain. What's happening in your brain is that when you have this experience one can map out in your uh, occipital cortex again electrochemical activity. That electrochemical activity is called a Neural Correlate of Consciousness, NCC for short. And scientists are struggling today to find what they call is the biological basis of consciousness. In fact, it's the number two question in science. The number one is, what's the universe made of? That's a separate discussion. 
So the number two question, open question in sciences, um, what's the biological basis of consciousness? And the answer is they don't know. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. So if the experience, and we could apply this to the other senses, but we're taking some aside right now. So then where is the experience of seeing me happening? And you said here. What do you mean by here? What location? What location? Do you mean Carlsbad? Do you mean La Costa? What do you mean by here? Hmm? Okay, so then where is that consciousness? Hmm? You are aware of me. I exist. True, but we started off the question, who is I and where is I? So no specific location, right? Yes. So I, every experience that we have is actually happening in a dimension that has no location in space time. In that dimension is also the experience of having a body-mind. The body-mind that I is experiencing, okay? The body mind that is experiencing this, this, and all this. That's I. <laughs> and it is not personal because it's not here, right? This is in I. This body mind is in I. Those body minds are in I. And the entire universe is in I. And I does not have a location in space time. So, not having a location in space-time, it is not subject to birth and death. Okay, but this is subject to birth and death and recycling or whatever. But the I in which the body-mind and all other body-minds are experienced is not subject to birth and death because it is not in time. If you are forced to say where is I, then you might say it's here, here, which I'm now referring to the space, which in the great wisdom traditions uh, is called Chit Akash. So Akash is the infinite space and Chit is, it's imbued with awareness. So awareness is out here. Now even Einstein, who, who's good scientist, but poor philosopher, um, or poor understanding of, you know, consciousness, which unfortunately was true of all of them, although they tried very hard, they had no experience, always looking out there. But he did come up with a very good mathematical formulation, which says that if you took out all the objects in the universe, all the objects, these objects, this object, this object, because this is an object in the universe. What would you be left with? Hmm? So what somebody said space, okay? No, you would be left with something that is totally dimensionless and even space-time would disappear, okay? Space-time is only possible if there are objects and there is relationship between objects. So what would be left if you took out all the objects of the universe would be something that has no dimension whatsoever as we know dimensions. Because you know, dimension means boundaries, okay? Now he did not go beyond that, he would say, but what he did point out, which is a very important thing, which 
cosmologists even struggle with today is that space-time are also emergent properties. Okay, we take space-time to be a given. We take matter to be a given. We take energy to be a given. But these are emergent phenomena. And they are emergent as activities, not as things. Okay, so your body is an activity, not a thing. Your mind is an activity and not a thing. These objects are activities. At a fundamental level, everything is an activity. Even what we call inanimate objects, they're activities because they're made up of atoms and atoms of particles, and these are all ultimately waves of potentiality that are coming out of this infinite void, but the infinite void is not the experience of space. The experience of space is only possible when there are objects. You don't see space. You see objects and then you infer space. And we also know that space is a way of measuring time. So there is, the further you are in space, you also are further in time. And actually there's an observatory in Arizona where you can see starlight that was born before our solar system came into existence. Amazing, isn't it? And you can see it. So space-time, matter, energy are all activities in something that has no dimensions whatsoever, as we know dimensions, boundaries, either in space or time. So imagine a chitta kash, which is totally dimensionless, but which is bubbling out right this moment as you, me, and the entire universe. Science today has got to the point where they refer to this as the quantum vacuum. But they still think of the quantum vacuum as an energy field, which is wrong. Okay. Because they think in terms of matter, energy, space, time. They don't think in terms of consciousness. The chitakash is consciousness. It's I. So the more you can shift your allegiance to the real I, because the other I, which is Deepak, actually doesn't exist. It's a socially induced hallucination. If the other I doesn't exist, I can go inside your body with that, all the instruments in the world. There's no one there. Your body is an activity in I. Your mind is an activity in I. The universe is an activity in I. And if you can really, really grasp this experientially, it's freedom, total freedom. It's loss of fear of death. It's also a kind of uh, interesting detached ex exuberance. Because whatever is being created this moment will never exist anywhere in time. Your body today is not what it was yesterday not as your mind. So shift your allegiance, as I said to I, I is here, okay, and here is now. And it's the only I that exists. Now, of course, if you like the, the hallucination, <laughs> you can have it for as long as you want. It does no saying that you don't want to, you know, you enjoy it, <clears throat> make it fun, make it loving, make it compassionate, enjoy it, all the while remembering that it is the creation of the one I, which is you. Okay, so. There's one sentence in the Bhagavad Gita that says this very beautifully, prakratim swam vashtvai vishrajami puna puna, curving back within myself, I create again and again, I create again. In every moment, of space-time. Even the creation of space-time is in every moment. So learn to witness your own body from here. 
and fear never goes away. Right? Okay.